Andrea, how are you doing? Welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. It is an absolute honour to have you here on episode one. Um, I feel like we're, we're starting off with a bang. Um, it's it's such a pleasure to have you on board. As the current world's strongest woman, that is phenomenal. It's, it's the greatest achievement that you could ever hope for in this world of strong man and strong woman. Um, how did you get from, you know, just basic gym goer, you're a crossfitter before, what's kind of, what's the transition been like moving from that to, to the world's strongest woman? That's an incredible feat. Um, to be honest, I, I didn't know that I was strong. Um, it was only when um, I, would do, I was doing the ward grace, which is the floor to overhead as many times as possible. And the coach was like, Andrew, you know, you're really strong. Um, have you ever considered going into some sort of strength sport? And I was like, no. And at that time, I'd never even heard of a strong woman. I'd vaguely watched Strong Man on TV. I'm so sorry to say that I didn't follow Strong Man at all for a long time. Um, and it was kind of, it was a seed that was set in my head then. And I, I a couple of weeks later, I went and searched for, um, like, a strength, just Googled, like, strength competitions and came across Britain's Strongest Woman. Um, and... Then I'd sign myself up for it, and then I realised I had no idea what a yoke was. I didn't know what a log was. I never touched <laughs> any of these instruments. Um, I'd seen an atlas stone, but I'd never touched one. So then I had to. Then I did another little bit of research and found my coach Ben um, from Suffolk Strength Academy, and he had a couple of girls going there as well. Um, and he was like, Andrew, you know, we've got six, you've got six weeks, and I was like, well, we kind of need to get a move on then. Um, so before that, he he suggests I go into um, Hertfordshire's Strongest Woman 2015 just to get a feel for a competition. Right, yeah. Because um, I've obviously never competed before. I've done like a couple of CrossFit throwdowns, but they're a little bit different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I won, I won the Hertfordshire Strongest and then went on to Britain's and came third. That's amazing. My... So was was the Hertfordshire, was that kind of uh, like a, a feeder to Britain's? Did you have to compete in that in order to get to Britain's? Or was this really just kind of like a trial run for you? Um, that particular, because they were run by two different, Britain's was run by somebody and England's was run by somebody else. Oh, okay. Um, Hertfordshire's was run by, um... oh God, sorry. Hertfordshire's was a qualifier for England's right. then. Okay. So after I did Britain's, I then went on to do England's. Right, okay. But now the transition is a lot smoother. You've got a qualifier, England's, Britain's, all run by the same person. So. Oh, okay, amazing. So so back then, it kind of, you didn't have to go through that whole qualifying period. You could kind no. of jump, jump straight in. That's amazing. So how long had you previously uh, been doing CrossFit for prior to kind of the, the transition or just kind of giving it a go really which it kind of sounds like and just being an absolute natural animal which is incredible um probably about a year I think um because I still did a little bit of CrossFit while I was in doing Strongman as well um for about six months and I kind of realized I couldn't do both I had to pick right. um so it was about a year I was doing CrossFit for and, and previous to that I was doing boot camps I joined a boot camp um and the guy that was running that then opened up this CrossFit gym um, and I actually got through his gym by using a Groupon so again that was just a little bit of a trial wow that is team absolutely for like incredible. 10 classes <laughs> so that's mad and, and and prior to this kind of in your youth uh, did you do kind of any sports were you a sporty person or was it just literally like this strange uh kind of like series of events that led you to to kind of getting involved within Strongman um, the only sports I really did as a child was probably at high school, and that was um, javelin and shot put. Any okay. kind of track event I used to avoid because I, I hated running then. I still hate running now. <laughs> um, they knew I hated running at CrossFit, and they so I would go on the rower okay. while they were running around the block. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I'm just not doing it. I'm not doing it. <laughs> and that's how I've always been. I don't find any any thrill in running at all. So. I don't I don't do it um so the the thing I did at school was mainly shot put and driving and I um actually held the school record for about 10 years I, I've actually inquired about it to see if I'm still the record holder for the shot the javelin 
That's amazing. Um, and again, I didn't like running with it, so it was a standing just a standing throw. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's that's crazy. That's that's interesting because my background previous to to kind of getting involved within the strongman scene was uh, athletics, which was it was shot put and discus. So kind of yeah. the, the the carryover, I understand that a lot. But as someone who followed athletics for a very very long time. I can massively respect that a static javelin throw to hold a record with a static javelin throw is an incredible feat of strength. That's quite amazing. So to hold it for that long is is insane. <laughs> That's mad. So with your CrossFit, I've always found this quite interesting because when you look at uh, kind of like the greats of kind of, you know, Eddie Hall, he had a huge, huge childhood in um, swimming, which built up his aerobic capacity, which I think kind of had some carry across over to strongman which still allowed him to kind of carry that huge frame and still be able to get through those mobile events quite well. As someone that did CrossFit, which in my mind is, it's a combination of both kind of the aerobic side of things and the strength side of things. Do you feel like that had kind of quite a, a decent carryover to Strongman? I feel like we're seeing a lot more people kind of making the transition from CrossFit to other sports, some strength sports. We're seeing it massively in rugby, athletics. You know, these guys that are super, super fit, they just have the ability to kind of do everything. Did you feel that there was a carryover there? Do you know what? It's only um, only since I did body, the thing at Body Power um, last weekend, that was the only time I really realised that I built those foundations at CrossFit. Um, wow. Again, I'm still learning. It's It's been such a massive learning process for me this last four years. I'm still learning what my body's capable of doing. And um, 100%, the CrossFit thing has built foundations. It taught me how to lift, even though I was, probably wasn't doing it the best uh, form back <laughs> back in the in the day. But it, it gave me the... Um, the ability to have an endurance base mm -hmm. um you know there's a lots of, of high intensity uh, work going on um having the power i'm using my legs as like powerful implements by jumping on boxes and having to skip a lot and all that kind of thing I just didn't realize it at the time uh -huh. that you're kind of building this foundation of something bigger um and i think it has definitely carried over and also like i said with the thing of the body power last week <laughs> It's amazing what the body remembers, because yeah. um, you know, I was doing burpees, which I haven't. I had, you know, got sick of doing those back in the day, but I had to do those multiple times and throw myself over you know, like a four foot wall um, as if it was nothing, um, which I panicked about to start off with, and actually yeah, got and it was fine. Yeah, well, well um, when we caught up, you you kind of told me about. Uh, I looked across at the arena, and you kind of you have these huge balls and walls and yeah. rigs, and kind of you've got ski ergs and rowers and all this sort of stuff. And and as someone that competes in strongman now, I look at that and kind of, I kind of look at it with a bit of hesitation and concern, yeah. kind of like can can the body still handle that now? But it yeah. obviously it can. Like that that was fantastic. Yeah. It really hurt, mind you. It wasn't easy, and I <laughs> tour for a long time in between each event. But you know, the recovery time was was quicker than I expected, and um, the ability to go for twenty, for, you know, to do a twenty five minute wad, whereas normally in strongman you're doing like something for a one uh, a minute, or you're doing sets of five. They're all very short and sharp, whereas these long, um, long exercises, so long periods of time, has given me. That there, yeah, that definitely is definitely giving me that foundation to to build on. Yeah, a hundred percent. And and when you transitioned across from kind of do it, doing the CrossFit stuff to the strong strong man and strong woman stuff, um, did you find that the it was in fact the strength that kind of continued? that you needed to continue to build on? Or was it a case of that it was kind of the aerobic mobile stuff, uh, kind of like the Husafel stone, the yokes, the thing where, well, that's a lot more mobile. Did you find that you needed to do more work on your mobile work or more work on your strength and static stuff? Um, my The strength stuff, it, it just increases. I transitioned to strongman. It, um, you know, I, I, I stripped everything. I Well, I didn't, but I... I got stripped back. My technique got stripped back. Um, my form, my breathing, and once I changed those, um, my lifts just increased. A lot of my static lifts just went flying high. So I know I left CrossFit with like 160 pound, 160 kilo deadlift. Wow! And within 
a few months I was up to about 200. That's amazing. I mean, yeah, even even, even leaving with 160 is, is a fantastic weight, but to go yeah. up to, to kind of jump 40 kilos in that amount of time is, is That was a gym phenomenal. record as well. That was a gym record for everybody <laughs> for 160. That's it was like amazing. crazy. <laughs> so when you kind of talk about stripping it back, was, was this with um, the gentleman uh, that you had previously been working with within the CrossFit gym? Or did no, you hire someone was... externally? Um, so I was, I moved, uh, to Suffolk Strength Academy, um, which is the strength and conditioning gym that I'm at now. And, um, he came, he's from a powerlifting, Olympic lifting background. Okay. So the lifts, you know, the lift and the, the hand position, the breathing is all completely different, you know, CrossFit to any kind of strength training. With CrossFit, it's just get it done as quickly as possible most of the time, whereas you've got to, um, move better you're lifting heavier weights so you have to move with it better don't you you know you can't just rep out and bounce and throw bars and stuff that yeah, <laughs> yeah most definitely um so yeah ben ben stripped a lot of my technique right back um and then we focus on the more um mobile stuff because again i'd never carried anything um particularly heavy uh-huh. i'd never done the yoke so um that was all changed and well it was just introduced to me really just to see what I could do yeah and then we worked on what I was bad at which is still carrying anything <laughs> so would you say that, that the mobile aspect of, of strongman is probably st- still an area that you're finding that you're needing to do more work on and actually the static stuff you, you've kind of you've really found your, your pacing with and you've really settled into a good rhythm with all of your static work um, I don't think it's the mobile stuff as such. It's the carrying, anything carrying. So I'm, I'm really good at the yoke. Um, uh-huh. I'm good at numbers. Um, you know, anything that dragging, pushing, pulling. I'm really good at all that kind of stuff. It's just the carrying. Okay. Um, I blame my little T-Rex arms, but in theory, I do have all enough arms to. I mean, I'm not like your massive dang. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They would just go on forever. You know, yeah. Yeah. I don't have like getting around the bigger stones. I'm literally, you know, faces on the stone just to try and get around the bottom of it. Yeah. So I find that that's a lot more difficult for me to get it to my chest or to a position where it's going to be comfortable. Um, then when I think I've got it comfortable, it sits too hard on my chest and then I panic and then can't breathe and then everything goes wrong. So that's something that I've been learning to fix. Um, is been something over the carry. years that you're working, that you're just still working on today. It's, it was something, yeah yeah ongoing okay very very cool so um with with your training were there any kind of when you looked at anything when you looked at things and you you were stripping bits and pieces back was there anything that kind of uh was that needed drastic change that in order to kind of help you with your strong man strong woman stuff was there anything that was kind of massively holding you back with your technique kind of things that you couldn't quite get your head around whether it was the breathing the setup position the bar pathing what was kind of the biggest learning curve for you um I think one one of them that I still am a little bit um, slack on is actually if you're doing something for a minute, I stop before the minute's up. Okay, and, so and you're don't... talking here just for, for people that maybe don't understand kind of how strongman works. This is kind of in an event scenario, so kind of we, we have a lot in, in strongman scenario, with 60 seconds on the timer. Yeah, 60 seconds, or if I'm in the gym and there's like a timer going and I've got, you know, I'm supposed to do something for a certain amount of time and I can hear the bleeps going down for like 10, 9, 8, then I'll stop before it gets to the end. Okay. And that's it's a habit that I, I don't know where I picked it up from, but I think, oh, it's nearly a minute, I'm done. But in theory, <laughs> cost me an extra rep which then could cost me a placing somewhere yes um or even if i'm doing like a sled push and pull or if i'm doing a yoke and i just think all right i'm done now i'm almost at the line i'll just put it down here and again in a competition you can't do that because that's a matter of seconds to pick it up and put it over the line so it's little things like that that i'm lazy with i suppose i think well I'm, i'm nearly there so i'll just do it whereas actually i need to be over and has that kind of has that bit you in the arse, so to speak, in in any competitions? Yeah, it cost me first place in two thousand and seventeen for world's strongest woman. Wow, that's I, crazy. I came, home, came home with fourth after that, and, and I and... was 
as you can imagine, I wasn't very happy. I actually, I actually gave up the sport after that. I gave up my, I hung up my belt after that. So what was brought you back? What was, what was the thing that kind of brought you back into the? Um, a bit of a slap from the coach. Um, a bit of time out. Um, just him getting me back into the gym and and just getting me training for fun again. Okay. Until um, until I think the until the hunger came back. Uh huh. Uh huh. And then yeah. I was like, I was like, nah, I'm not going through that again. I'm going to win it this year. Okay. It was hot. I can't. I can't even describe how heartbreaking it was. You know what? I I can't even imagine. I came fourth at Britain's Strongest Novice after w- winning my first two competitions, and I was so incredibly angry at myself that I didn't do better, which was absolutely <laughs> absurd. Um, so I a hundred percent. I can't even begin to imagine what kind of what you felt like because i mean at that stage and at that at that level it's uh it's like everything is under a magnifying glass as well and i think it's a fantastic point to kind of hop off on how how do you, how do you deal with the, that kind of pressure and being on that stage because kind of what you said to me it's not like you've been kind of at the elite level of sports and this transition was quite easy what kind of from what you've said you haven't really done anything to kind of a crazy crazy high standard so to come into this that must have been mad for you to kind of be stepping up onto this world stage with the biggest and the best from around the globe how how do you deal with that do you know what? I, I, people ask me that all the time, and I, I don't know. It's something that, again, I've had to learn to deal with. I was very um, nervous when I first started, and the nerves used to get the better of me. Um, I, you know, I wouldn't be able to pick up the implements because I'd be shaking so hard. And I think the more competitions I did, the more I was able to put those nerves into – and not obviously learning to breathe as well. That was something that I was taught to breathe properly um, when I'm – we almost feel like you're, you're um, hyperventilating. You know, okay. your breathing becomes that erratic, mm-hmm. and that's how I was getting. Um, that's how I was getting when I was about to go into competition. But also, um, when I went to do my first Arnold's, um, I was I became scared of flying all of a sudden. I, my anxiety just took over, okay. so I went through hypnotherapy. I did three sessions of hypnotherapy just to get me on the plane and it wasn't the competition I was worried about it was the plane journey and for me to be that anxious before I go to a competition I had to have that kind of um that kind of treatment and that actually helped me the hypnotherapy helped me with the breathing helped me with realigning my in my thinking um and I find that music in my ears lots of hard swearing um Eminem is a really good one of mine that I have in my ears quite loudly yeah um so yeah i don't i don't really know i can't really describe it properly but i um i just take myself away shut myself away Uh um i become um the person that people don't want to be around when i'm competing outside a competition before the competition after the competition i'll be a best friend (laughs) while i'm competing because i might say something i don't mean or um i just look really mean (laughs) Which, um, which is amazing because for anyone that hasn't met you in real life, y- you are exactly all of those points that you said. You are just the kindest, sweetest, most open-hearted person that will just talk to anyone. And you know what? I am the exact same. I know exactly what you're talk- talking about. I'll have a conversation with anyone, but as soon as it's game time, it's like, nah, that's it. Gloves are off. Don't don't talk to me. I don't want to hear it. Because they like, well, one minute she was okay to me a minute ago, and now so she's all like just i'm sorry you know talk to me afterwards headphones are in and i i tend to take myself off and i'm pacing a lot and you know i stretch and warm up by myself i don't really like talking to anyone when i'm doing i try and avoid eye contact with people um but i think that's a little ritual as well that i've kind of developed to get me focused okay okay yeah i mean it, it, it makes sense i think it also kind of allows you to there aren't kind of loads and loads of stimuli kind of going through your brain. You can kind of process everything a lot better, can't you? When you're kind of away from kind of the yeah. noise of of everyone else. And I think it's quite difficult because kind of the thing that I have realized in, in, in strong man and strong woman, and you might be able to kind of um, talk more about this here, is that interestingly enough, I find it's incredibly sociable, like to, to, to a strange, to a strange level. Like in, in my competitions, I found that, 
the guys are kind of uh, are chatting between events, which I found really, really bizarre because as a background in athletics, it was like, you have your place over there. I have my place over here. We don't talk. We don't look at each other. We step up. We throw. If you throw further than I do, I'm coming for your ass and I'm going to throw even further and you're the enemy. But how, how do you... Do you find that that's kind of the same at the higher levels or do you find that that kind of fizzles away is all very much kind of dog eat dog out there? Um, yeah, definitely. It it does change as you um, go through the ranks, to be honest, mm -hmm. um, which was is quite difficult to deal with when the girls you've kind of um, almost like grown, grown in the sport with yeah. um, then become your main competitors. Um, especially once I won Worlds, I instantly felt like I'd got a target on my back. Wow. And obviously going into Worlds, I could see the progression I was making. That I, I was there for a purpose. I think they could see that this time. Yeah. Um, th there wasn't much, to be honest, especially at Worlds just this last year. There wasn't much um, communication. The, the British girls, we all kind of stick to kind of in our little nations. Right, okay. Um, uh, so the British girls were all kind of, um congregated in one little area and we kind of had a little band between us um but again we're all different categories as well so we're not really in direct competition apart from obviously my main competitor who i am friends with um but we're there to beat each other at the end of the day so we're not going to stand there and talk about what we had for breakfast and how excited we are to be there today it, we, you know it's game time for us and how does that dynamic um, work like how do you how do you juggle kind of the, the friendship competitor uh, kind of relationship there? Because that must be a really, really strange one. Is it again a case of, you know, as soon as that whistle goes, it's it's we're out for blood. And then as soon as the final whistle goes and the presentations have been done, we can hug it out. We can go for a drink. How, how do you kind of how do you play that? It's um, I think it's a mutual respect because. You kind of, you know, you've both worked your butts off to get there. You you both know how hard it is um, to be there, to do the competition, to bust out your guts in the event. You, you both know which your weaker and uh, most uh, strongest events are. Mm -hmm. um, so even at the end of each event, you know, it's, it's, well, a lot of the time we're one to, one to one, so we're side by side competing. And we will fist pump each other afterwards. And like, well done. You know, that was a great. And after, after the Arnold's, I gave her a hug and I was like, thanks for another great show because it was an amazing, it was, it's amazing to compete against somebody of, um, who I admire, you know, she works just as hard as I do. Yeah. Um, and she has a full-time job and I only have a part-time job. So I know how hard it is. Well, that that's um, amazing. Yeah. Yeah. But it's not always like that. There are other girls who will not, um, socialize with you and who will make you feel very uncomfortable. Um, and again, I think that's just their strategy of trying to make you feel um, uncomfortable, you know, just make you feel like you're going to do something bad and it makes you feel weird and they're staring at you a lot and they're making comments. I've had one girl who, uh, not that I'm bitter about it at all, but I went up to do um, a, log, a log lift in 2007 uh, to go for the world record and she said something to me as I went to the platform which I didn't take much notice of at the time, but I missed the lift. Okay. And it was only afterwards that I kind of registered that what she said to me as I was approaching the platform and she put me off. Wow. So since then I have learned to headphones until I'm called on and avoid anybody. That's interesting. So, so do you find kind of at the international level that there's a, uh there are a lot more mind games. There are a lot more people kind of trying to get into your head and get under your skin and roll you up. Definitely. Um, and again, when, when I first hit the international stage, it was very strange to go from for the British girls to international because you kind of, you get to know the British girls and you think, well, you know, they're nice. They're not nice. You don't talk to them. Um, and then you instantly want to be part of a big group, but actually, they don't want to be part of your group. They want to beat you and they'll do whatever they can to beat you. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, but again, I can now laugh back at them and say, well, it didn't work this time. I let you do that to me once. It's not going to happen again. It's like, you know, you, you cost me once you won't cross me again. Yeah. Why don't you do it again? Yeah. That, that, and that's life. Yeah. That is my life. <laughs> I, th I think it's, it's, it's a, it's a smart way to be, isn't it? And kind of, 
when you get to that level, it is it's and you'll probably be able to kind of back me up on this, is that it's such small margins as well. And it's something that I've discovered like very, very early on in, in kind of Strongman. The more kind of competitions I watch, the more, the more you realise, you know, the difference between first place and second place can be 0.5 points, you know, not even a whole point. So if you're able to get underneath someone's skin and maybe, you know, they take a, a half a second longer on that yoke and you can trim off that time, you know, you, you've succeeded. So you can tell why these people are, are, are really kind of trying to get under your skin and play these games. But I think, do you think that it's something that you're, you've are you kind of built on each year? Like you've learned how to handle the situations better? Um, or is it just a case of that you just, you found that routine of headphones on, switch everything off? Or do you kind of feel like you've you've hardened up should we say, to kind of like the the onslaught of kind of crap that people are going to throw at you th- kind of throughout the day? Yeah, I've definitely hardened up. Um, I think the, the sport has taught me that, actually. And it's not... Uh, the, 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 when the new girls come in, a lot of them say how friendly it is, how everyone's really nice. I'm like, it is, very, it is on a whole very nice and very friendly until you get to a certain point. Um. So unfortunately, you do have you learn the hard way. You know, everyone you learn do life the hard way, and that's shutting myself off, taking myself away. That's something that I've learned to do um, because of the experiences that I've gone through. Yeah, yeah, most definitely, most definitely. And when you're kind of travelling for these international events, what? what kind of uh, is your protocol around kind of traveling with the event obviously if you're in England it's not too much of an issue because you're kind of only having to drive kind of an hour or two or maybe even three hours away for, for your competition you can be back kind of the same day or maybe stay overnight when you're going away to these big big competitions are you kind of going over there beforehand a couple of days before to kind of get settled obviously you have the whole ordeal of uh of time differences for you obviously if you're traveling kind of to, to stateside or in the opposite direction the, the time difference is obviously going to have a massive impact on you and your sleep and your alertness so how have you kind of found that um it's it i've got used to that again it's something um kind of getting yourself into a routine once you're there um so the week the competitions are normally sort of friday saturday sunday so i would leave on the wednesday get there wednesday night i'd have Thursday to um you kind of just you, you get there and it's about tea time so you go and find something to eat get to your hotel unpack and then you go to bed at normal time I'm normally awake about three o'clock in the morning wow. so I'll just stay in bed um with the lights off um and then I'd probably have another nap and then I'll be awake about five so they come Thursday then you go with the normal day's routine then the Friday there's chances that you're competing so Friday's usually when the the jet lag starts to kick in um so I, i'm just like i'd have breakfast at the breakfast time um the normal things that you would do to combat uh jet lag anyway and just excess amounts of caffeine yeah. um but then what i find difficult is the coming home okay that's it that's when it really hits me is um you know you compete all weekend you probably go out on the friday on the sunday night fly home with a hangover um and then the jet lag kicks in tuesday wednesday time and it can take me almost a week to get back to normal wow um, but the, probably the first time I think I went to a competition international, I was tired on the first day. Um, but you just have, it's almost like you are reprogramming your body just for one day. Come on, you, you throw in all the supplements, all the stimulants just to keep you going. And you definitely feel the crash in the evening. Yeah. You just want to sleep. Um, but yeah, it's, you kind of, again, it's just something I've learned to do. You just get used to the the time zone time difference yeah 100 percent. and kind of what would uh, a traditional week kind of uh, post a big international comp so let's say a uh, world or arnold's kind of look for you what kind of things uh, are you implementing into your week are you kind of are you having physiotherapy do you do cryotherapy is it stretching is it yoga steam room saunas is it just literally chilling out resting relaxing not doing any training what would a usual week kind of look like for you before I compete or after? Uh, after you compete, so kind after. of, uh, yeah, post um, To be honest, I tend to go um, 
get back to the gym as quickly as I can. And that would usually just be a stretching, moving, a little bit of light cardio. Um, and it's usually a, a good chance for me to catch up with my coach and, and go through the competition with him. Um, but I, I literally, then when I'm home, I'm mum straight away. So as soon as I land, that's Andrea athlete's gone and now it's mum. Right. So I don't have time to go to yoga in Christ. I might have, depending on how beaten up I am, I might go and see my physio and have a massage, but it's normally just a lot of sleep. Yeah. Just try to catch up and sleep when I'm back at work and I'm I'm, I'm mum. So it's all yeah. as I walk through that door. <laughs> well, I think I think that's that's another phenomenal point that you've kind of brought up there. And for anyone that's listening, it might seem a little bit weird that actually in a lot of other professional professions, when you are the best in the world at your chosen sport, it's usually the, a fair point that that is your job. That's kind of what you're doing and that's yeah. your life. So you can kind of, you can give a lot of time and a lot of effort to that. But for someone like yourself, and this is kind of another reason why I admire you so much, is that you're you're juggling being the best in the world at your sport with Fine. being <laughs> a mum as well and handling a job. How does that dynamic work for you because that's that's just incredible um it can be stressful um particularly if i've got a, a big comp coming up it is um it's very regimental um i'm thankful i can work my own diary so what my husband's at work as a shift worker so when he's at home i would work um and vice versa um i have a really good support network so i've got my best friend does some of the school runs my mother-in-law will have the girls overnight if I need them to. Um, but it's in the lead up to Worlds, and what I didn't realise until afterwards was that I was literally mum in body for about eight weeks. Um, so I don't even remember doing school half the school. I don't remember doing homework. I don't remember doing the reading at night time. I just know that it was, we get up, I get up at half past six, I feed myself, the girls get up at seven, I feed them, it's out the door at half past eight, I'm at the gym for 10, I'm at work for 12, home for five, feed the girls, do the after school sports clubs. And then I'm crashed out by about half a state. Wow. And that's just how life was for six to eight weeks. So I hardly saw my husband. Um, and I, although I did see my girls, I just didn't feel like I was here for them. Um, but now that I've kind of had this downtime, work has come back to bite me in the butt. Everything, I put so much stuff off at work, which I did, again, I didn't realize. <laughs> Um, and working in edu further education, that's quite important when you come into government funding and all that kind of stuff. So um, it was, it, it can get really, really stressful. Yeah. But everyone's used to it now. The family are kind of used to it. Um, so everything's on the calendar. So everyone knows where they've got to be. Anything that, that does throw everything out is if a child's sick. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and that's a real spanner in the works. Um, but again, I've got a really good support network that can help me out with that. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, and realistically, I mean, obviously you're going to know about this more than I am. Is is it a possibility that that this can open any doors to allow you to focus full time on your training and nutrition and stuff? Or is it a case of that there just there isn't the funding there to allow... Uh, world-class female athletes like yourself to be able to literally devote a hundred percent of their time and, and energy into well not a hundred percent because of course you've got the kids but allow you to de to envelop yourself within this world and not have to worry about work is that not a possibility i i can't see it being a possibility for me at the moment i mean it might be for the next generation of strong women that are coming up um you know there's the sponsorships are slowly coming in for the ladies now um, and I'm very fortunate. I do have a couple of uh, sponsors that help me that, and it is helping you out really. It's not, I don't depend on them. Um, like my hubby does a lot of overtime to pay for my international competitions. Wow. Um, and it's, you know, it, it's money out of our family pot at the end of the day as well. So I'm really grateful that he's, he's doing that for me. He's allowed me to grow and, and go off and do these things. But um, you can be really, really lucky as, as a female, as a woman, to get enough sponsorship to enable you to not have to go to work. But I can't see it being a possibility. Is it just incredibly rare within this sport or is it just incredibly rare just kind of as a female athlete, do you think? 
as I think it's as a female athlete as a whole, I was really fortunate enough to meet some of um, some British Olympic gold medalists a couple of weeks ago. And out of uh, six of us, there's only one that does it full time. My God. Um, you know, that doesn't have to go to work. The rest of us work. And they, they're Olympic gold medalists. In my eyes, that's a lot more than World's Strongest Woman. And I was in, in, in complete awe of these ladies. Uh, one of them has just had a little baby as well. He's nine months old. So she's obviously taking my turn to leave at the moment, but she works also. Um, but yeah, I do think it is women's sport as a whole, unfortunately. That's, it's, it, it's, it's quite fascinating and extremely sad that at the same time that kind of, you know, we're not at a point where we can kind of see you guys being on an equal level with kind of the, the, the male athletes that are able to travel around, that are able to go around the world, being funded by these sponsorship deals and brand deals and stuff. Mm. But I also think on the flip side of things, I also think it makes what you guys do that much more impressive because yeah. you can yeah. tell that you aren't driven by money. And that is the most incredible thing to see and i think it's incredibly inspiring for young females that are looking up to strong women like yourself just to say actually you know what it doesn't have to be about the money if you enjoy something enough and you want to be the best at something you can do it you've just got to dig in deep you've got to pull everything together you've got to get focused and you've got to go out and do it so i 100 percent commend you on that i think that's absolutely incredible that you've been able to do that in a, again a sport that probably doesn't highlight the achievements of women quite as much as the men but i definitely think we're kind of we're getting somewhere very very slowly but i think that's kind of across the board i mean i think yeah it's definitely getting there um you know the women have got uh, are getting a bigger stage you know we, we were up on the road stage now at the arnold's which is two years ago that wasn't even a thing um the the national you know the national British star, uh, girls are getting more um, sort of bigger audiences. The events are, are taking place at bigger places. You know you've got Bloodstock Festival this year. You've got England's Strongest Woman happening tomorrow um, at a festival in Lichfield, I think it's called. So and that's going to have a massive um, audience there. Bloodstock's going to be amazing. Yeah. Um, and I think that will be the biggest audience for British girls that's currently. Fantastic. And that's gone from little car park, little gym uh, competitions, and we're getting pushed up. You know, but it takes it takes a really good promoter and someone who really believes in what we can do. And Anne Brown, for one of those people, who is um, pushing the girls to get onto these bigger stages because he sees what we've got. You know, and that's it. It's, it will take more than just one person to get to get us to the guy to where the guys are at. Yeah, it's, you know, it's yeah, it's definitely a movement, isn't it? You're yeah, kind of, definitely. You're, you're it's, kind of... it's changed a hell of a lot since I even started. In the four years, it, it, you know, it has changed a hell of a lot. Think, it's yeah, prize money for women. It's not, it's not as much as the men, mind you, but it's better than your bus fare home, like it was. Um, yeah. You know, there are things coming through. Um, so it's getting there. Slow, slowly, slowly but surely, you kind of, it's all moving in the right direction. Which you know, I, I guess it's better than nothing, but it's it's kind of something that I think kind of needs to. I think it it needs to be spoken about even more. Um, you know, I we can see it now that kind of equality in sport is becoming bigger and bigger, and it's becoming a lot more poignant, especially kind of in the year of twenty nineteen, where every everyone is becoming a lot more socially aware. Um, but I still think there is kind of this massive separation, but between the two. Um, but like you said, it's 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 very slowly. You guys are getting the bigger platforms now, which is really really awesome. We're getting a few competitions now where we're kind of getting the females and the males that are competing competing in the bigger standards, which is which is really really awesome. But for for you kind of progressing on now, obviously you're holding the title. Everyone is looking at you as a singular person. Where do you go from here? Um, uh, there's a couple of um, world records that I'd like to get this year. Um, Anything that you're able to disclose or is this kind of under wraps? Um, I think it's quite common knowledge. I want to get the world record for the log lift this year. Okay, and what would that be? Um, I, I think it's currently at 122. Um, so yeah, that'll be okay. <laughs> 
Um, and uh, I don't know. I might have a go, but I might have another go at the yoke. Cause my yoke record got broken this year, just recently. I did. I set a 300 kilo yoke record last year. And what time um, was that? It was 17 seconds and 20 meters. Wow. Okay. But it got broken a couple of weekends ago and was 14 seconds. I was like, <sighs> and three seconds is a long time. Is a is very a long time. Um. So I might go but it broke me a lot last year my back didn't like it at all last year so i might go for that and um uh, yeah and just probably try and maintain my title again but if i don't get if i don't maintain it then i'm I'm not going to be like huh, because i've won it already however i would like to win it again <laughs> i think it's just the competitive nature of athletes isn't it yeah. it's like what once yeah. you've once you've tasted that victory and kind of how good it feels to to, to podium and, and stand at top of the podium as the world's strongest woman you kind of want to keep on doing it forever <laughs> it's, it's kind of one of those things there'll be a time where it won't happen i know that but um i'm feeling good this year so i think having a lot of uh a lot of downtime a lot of off season um i've had time to rebuild rethink realign my chakras and just get back in the game and, and are you finding kind of the the longer you're in the sport, you're getting a lot more selective about kind of what you're doing uh, yeah. and not kind of putting your body through all this turmoil of hitting these unnecessary comps and kind of wearing down your central nervous system before coming into a big show like the Arnold's kind of how many shows would you say you're kind of doing a year now? Um, well, this year will be, um, and I've actually today, I've just taken one of those shows away and that was just through, um, talking to, to, uh, to Lisa about some bits and pieces. Um, uh, and just, it was an unnecessary competition. I planned, it was a log record in Lithuania. I was going to do it, but it's not, it's in September. Now I plan to do it in October. Uh, that's what I've been planning all year round. Mm -hmm. So for it to come forward a month and a half, means I need to peak a lot earlier than I plan to within my training because you've got welders in November. Okay. So for me to peak for September, come down and then peak again for worlds, that's how I'm now thinking as an athlete, I guess. When would be the best time for me to peak in my training? And in theory, it's going to be the week before I go to World's Strongest Woman, and that would be the best time for me to set, uh, you know, to break the world record. Yeah. Um. And then, so yes, I've taken the competition away. Um, but last year I competed from April right through to December. Various different competitions. I did the I had to do the qualifier for England, so I had to do the three qualifier, uh, the Basingstoke, England, and then Britain's. Wow. I was invited out to Portugal, so I did that competition there for a day. Um, did Barcelona in September did a truck pull in the middle of the summer and then I went out to world. So my God, and then I had eight weeks. Then I had to do Arnold's in March. That's crazy. So how, how do you program for that? Because you're kind of, you've got multiple peaks. You've got quite realistically, you've got quite short times between competitions there where you're kind of, you're expecting to give your all. How on earth do you ever, kind of plan ahead for that kind of stuff um i just have a really good programmer john clark does my programming and and i hassle him quite a lot and he gets the wrath of my emotions and anxieties um i don't i don't know i just i just have to trust the guys that do my programming the guys that coach me um and i just became very selfish i think last year you know, I'm doing this, this is what I'm going to do, and I have to do this, I have to compete here, I have to go there. So you do have to become very selfish um, when, you, when you're doing that amount of competing because it's not just the physical side of it, you've got to deal with the mental side of, of um, training and, and travelling, competing anyway. Um, but I was a bit of a mess. <laughs> I was glad to have Christmas off. But I had nine days off over Christmas um once we've done world and then i was back in the gym to get ready for the arnold so wow um, so i'm grateful to have this i think it'll be five five months off season this year that's i mean that's Again, that's a solid now. yeah yeah it's, it's a solid yeah, length a of time busy. i'm like i need to do something <laughs> so what what will you what will be the next thing that you'll be preparing for will it be anything prior to worlds yes um i'm doing a 
charity train pull in August. Um, I'm thinking about doing Britain's again. So this is another one. Do I do it? Do I not? Um, because Britain's is on the 10th of March. Um, but I think that would be a good start to my season, just to, to, to go into Britain's. So the train pull is an 86-ton uh, train. Mm-hmm. Uh, that I'm going to attempt to pull and set a world record for. Um, and then the log and deadlift record is the Static Monsters in October. Okay, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm um, aware of this, yeah. Uh, and oh, but, oh, Barcelona is at the end of September as well, so that's the qualifier for the Arnold in March. Okay, wow. So, I mean, you've, you've still got quite quite a few things on your plate, you know, like kind of even at yeah, this kind of... Yeah, to me, that's, it's, not, it's not a lot, to be honest. I think with the amount I did last year, that was a lot. This year, <laughs> the fun, the static monsters, there's only three lifts and three uh, three overhead and three three deadlifts, so that's not massive. The biggest one, I think, before Worlds is going to be Barcelona, because I've already got my pro card for the Arnolds, and I have to win that competition to get back to the, to the pro stage. Okay. Um, and I know some of the girls that will be going there will also be looking for their pro cards to um, try and beat me at that. So, you got precious. Bring, yeah, bring your A game, baby. That's what it's all about. You, uh, yeah, you got to come well, home with that first place. Everyone now needs to beat me, don't they? They're, I'm the one that they want to beat. They want to say, "Well, I've beat my strongest woman." You know, so I've that pressure is not very nice. <laughs> no, no. I, I mean, I, I can't. I can't imagine what it's like. It, it's. Um... Yeah, it's it's a strange dynamic, and I'm sure it probably changes relationships with people and relationships within certain groups, and kind of now people who were kind of previously friends are now kind of setting out to try and kind of get one over on you, and that dynamic probably is quite. It must be quite strange to kind of get used to that that kind of people that you uh, kind of enjoyed the company of uh, are now kind of seeing you as the number one threat. Yeah. Um, yeah it's just it's it's absolutely madness and i think your story in general is just absolutely insane to kind of turn around in such a short space of time one i think it kind of goes to show that anyone that's out there that might be listening to this podcast or kind of fall upon it that actually if you're if you're kind of curious and you kind of want to get involved you are the perfect person to kind of show look if you really do put your mind to it and you have a good coach and you have a good system in place, you can get on a world stage in under five years, which I mean, mm. for, for me as an aspiring strongman, to hear that is amazing because I think, I mean, for, for myself, who is a very, very competitive athlete, that's always that's always the dream. The dream is always to, to get to the best. That's it. I think I'm going to move you because my battery's about to die. So we're going to go to the top <laughs> It's gonna. Oh my god, my bedroom's such a mess. <laughs> this way. <sighs> we good? Yes, we good. Okay, let's okay. <laughs> be close up now. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Um, but but yeah, I think you know you really are kind of not just a role model for females but a, a role model for anyone that's kind of getting involved within strength strength sports in general to kind of show that even in a short space of time with everything in place and kind of the right coaching the right programming you can go on to kind of achieve uh, incredible things and i kind of i, I want to leave uh, the podcast on 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 this kind of question and it's it's a question I've kind of asked people before and I find it very, very interesting to kind of see what people think. But if if you had the opportunity to kind of go back and speak to kind of a, a younger version of yourself, you had a very, very limited amount of time and you could only really give kind of one piece of advice or one mantra to live by, what would you kind of say to the younger you to kind of help you get from where you were then to kind of where you are now? Um, that's really tough. That's really deep. That's a really deep question. It's <laughs> incredibly deep, isn't it? It's. it's... Um, I don't know. I th I think advice would be um, to go out and try something that you've not done before. Just oh, that's really crap. 
It's no, um, no, not at all. I, I completely understand. See, what it is is that um, I was never really um, encouraged to do anything but go to work as soon as I left school. Right. So there was no, there's no encouragement to go further education. There's no encouragement to take my, um, take up any sport because I was good at sport at school. I, I'm also a very good singer, and I was never encouraged to, to make that a thing when I was like going to be the next Whitney Houston at school. And I totally am going to be. <laughs> you know what? I believe you 100. <laughs> um, and I think, I think it would be again like believing. I would, I needed somebody to believe in my capabilities to believe that I could do something um so although I never didn't really have a bad upbringing I was just never encouraged to do anything better great you know to be the greatest person um so I think to be told you are great you are going to be great you're going to do this you're going to do that that's probably what I would go back and tell myself that's amazing. I, am, yeah. I, am, I know I'm good. Yeah. And <laughs> I, I think, and everyone has that inside of themselves as well. And I think sometimes it's quite hard for you to kind of look at yourself and kind of, and say kind of, I'm great, but to kind of be told and have that support network behind you, kind of exactly what you've said there. I think that's an incredibly powerful tool to kind of help people realize that, you know, everyone has that greatness inside of them. And sometimes it just kind of helps to have someone come along and kind of help yeah. kind of pull that out of you. Um, and but, if it wasn't if it wasn't for Sarah at CrossFit that day, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now. And I, I every time I see, her, I'm just like, you know, I wouldn't be doing this if it wasn't for you. They're making me go around the box, the bloody the block runs and and uh, doing the lifting stuff. It, if it wasn't for somebody like that telling me you are really good, you need to go and progress, take this further. I wouldn't. I wouldn't have done it. Yeah. Yeah, a hundred percent. I think take somebody and something to to tell, to get you that stage. Yeah, you just give it a go. Just yeah. whatever it is, give it a go. A hundred percent. If you I don't remember. like it, you have to do it again. <laughs> so true, so true. Um, but listen, thank you so 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 much for for coming on board. There are some incredible gems there that I think a lot of people are, are going to kind of take away from this and help them in their own journey. Um. I think that you're continuing to inspire people and show people that this is possible for anyone and not just anyone, but also in the female community as well. So I just want to say a massive, massive thank you to everything that you do within the strength sports, which is incredibly inspiring on both sides of the fence. I am incredibly honored to say that I know you and have the opportunity to chat to you like this because you've taught me so much about the sport already and also it just in this format being able to chat to you i have such a greater understanding of kind of what is needed and kind of the journey that everyone takes so thank you very much for taking time out to to kind of come and chat with me today i really really appreciate that thank you very much and hopefully at some point we will uh, be able to catch up again face to face maybe on a world stage somewhere Oh, we'll <laughs> see. Um, <laughs> but until next time thank you very much for coming on board and um, yeah we hope hope you'll come back Thank you. Bye.